Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Annie Black, and I am the Director of Programs at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. We are excited to welcome you for our Understanding Holocaust History Lecture today with archivist uh, Felicia Williamson. So before we get started, just one quick logistical note. Uh, we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, there is a handy Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and open up that box, type in your question, and we will answer your questions at the end. Again, you're welcome to type them in at any point during the program, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and do that at the end. And at that time, we will also have Sarah A. Bosch Jacobson, uh, our Chief of Education, join us for questions as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Felicia Williamson, our Director of Library and Archives. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're able to join us today. We're going to be speaking about one of the most impactful artifacts that we have at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, um, the Kukler album. I'm going to share my screen with you and then we'll get started. Okay. Okay, um, the Kugler album was donated to the museum by the MB and Edna Zale Foundation in memory of Edna Zale. And the reason they ended up with, the, with this album is because they had supported Lena Kugler in her efforts to rescue children after the Holocaust. Um, and she sent this album to them as a thank you for their support. Um, Lena met the Zales who are from Dallas um, in Paris after the war. Lena Kukler uh, was, survived the war by posing as a Catholic. She had false papers. Uh, she risked her life to save children who were orphaned due to the Holocaust. And she was really on the front lines of one of the worst humanitarian crises in history. Um, one thing to think about as we discuss this is sometimes when we imagine liberation and we are very purposeful in how we um, talk about this in the museum, we think of jubilee, of celebration. For many people, um, being liberated from the camps was, was really a continuation of the trauma they had experienced. And for children who had been in hiding um, or had been in camps themselves, they often were basically wandering the streets with nowhere to go and they had no idea if they had families, family members who had survived and there was a real crisis. And so um, Lena Kukler established an orphanage and had sometimes more than a hundred children that she was working to save. Um, and it was uh, pretty intense. We're gonna, we're gonna be talking about some intense things that happened to her and the children she was working to save. Um, as she, as she, before she did this work in 1945 to really for the rest of her life, she had been living as a Catholic. She'd been working as a nanny and a teacher. Um, she'd been um, turned into the Gestapo more than once. Uh, she finally escaped and went into hiding um, on an estate outside of Treblinka, which is a death camp actually. Um, her brother after the war received a high ranking position in the Polish government. And between him and the Jewish community working to save these children, she agreed to set up this orphanage. Um, a lot of the information I'm gonna be sharing with you today is coming from the album itself. Um, it's inscribed. And then a lot of, I'm gonna be actually reading her own words. She was interviewed by um, David Boder in France in 1946. Boder did a really huge interview project to try to document the experiences of Holocaust um, survivors. Um, and the interview is, is really telling. And so I'm just gonna read her own words to you rather than me try to um, replicate what she was sharing with us. Um, and then we'll take some time to really carefully examine the, the, the scanned images of the album. And just so you know, if you're in the, um, when we're back and able to spend time together again inside the museum, this album is on display as you exit the show wing, as you go through the 
um, Liberation Gallery or New Homes, New Lives, New Lives, New Homes, I'm sorry. Um, and so I invite you to spend some time looking at it there. So this is the first page of the album. Um, and basically, Lena writes this and says, here's what happened. I tried to save these children. Uh, we experienced anti-Semitism. We decided to move and escape. She took the children and smuggled them over the border from Poland through the Czech Republic, or at that time, Czechoslovakia, into France. Um, in Paris, she meets the Zales. They help her fund specifically medical care for these children. And this album is made as a thank you to send to them for all they did to make um, her work possible. As we'll find out, um, the, the task of caring for so many children is hard to imagine, but then the financial challenges of doing so in a time where you couldn't just wire money, there were a lot of restrictions on money and how to get money from across um, national lines and all kinds of things. So she, she does mention in her interview, which we'll, we'll go over um, several, several times that she constantly was afraid she would not have money to feed, clothe, and provide medical care for these children. So I'm gonna start reading some of the words of Lena Kukler herself. This is from 1946. They came to me from the Jewish committee with an appeal to take care of the children who were returning from various camps, from Auschwitz, whom people were bringing to the committee. And many Jewish children remained alive, but they are roaming, rambling, and have no roof over their heads. Something must be done for them and that I should organize a home for children, one of the first homes in Poland. So she's trying to portray part of what was an immense humanitarian problem, which is that there were people who had survived the Holocaust who had been in hiding, who had been in camps um, all over Europe and in Poland, who now that the Holocaust were over had nowhere to go. And the children were especially vulnerable uh, not only now, but not only in this period, but of course, always children are vulnerable, but children have been hidden and had serious medical conditions, including just old fashioned starvation. And so there was a real crisis on hand and the infrastructure to support these children was not there. So this is the second page in the album. And here she's telling the Zales with sad and wistful eyes, the children arrived to Zakopane after the war, May 1945. So these children are emerging from hiding and coming out of camps. Some children did survive camps, not very many. Um, and they have been through the kind of trauma that we really can't imagine. Um, Lena says, we decided to organize a home in Zakopane. Zakopane is a resort, especially for Dubuque tubercular children, children with tuberculosis. Zakopane is situated amid mountains, a very beautiful spot, but known for its anti-Semitism even before the war. There we rented a beautiful villa and we renovated it because it was ruined after the Germans. And there I went with the first group of children. The home had a capacity of 100 children and I always had the full number of children or even more. So she gathers over a hundred children. They go to this um, villa, they create an orphanage for um, Jewish children surviving the Holocaust. And she notes here that the area had rampant anti-Semitism and we'll find out that this become, becomes a big problem for the children there. Um, and when I talk to students about this, it's hard for me to even imagine having survived, having a group of children who've survived the Holocaust and still not feeling like these children were safe. And that's exactly the situation she found herself in. Here, Lena writes, they were so starved, so sickly, so covered with lice, so neglected morally, physically, and intellectually that a truly tremendous job arose before us. Moreover, we had absolutely no financial means. We had no budget for that. Um, here in the album, she writes that the staff was selected amongst Jewish survivors of the concentration camps of Auschwitz, Plaschow, Dachau, and others. In her interview, 
She says, it was very difficult for me to get personnel. There were absolutely no suitable people. There was no one. I picked out a certain group of women who had returned from the Lager Auschwitz, so Auschwitz concentration camp. These women had lost everybody. They had lost their husbands. They had lost their children. I said to them a few words. I told them that if they did not have their own children to take into their hearts, these children, these children who do not have their parents, we should become mothers to these children, that we should not work for ourselves, that we should not work for profit, that we should not work at it like a trade, but let us consecrate ourselves to these children. This will be the aim of our lives. And, in and indeed, our entire work was one great sacrifice. Our home was not a boarding home. It was not even a children's home. It was a big family. We worked from morning till night and we were under terrible stress. So um, there's another photo in the albums of the staff and it says here that a few months have gone on and the staff enjoyed their work. Um, so during this humanitarian crisis, she had to find people who were willing to take on this very um, impossible to imagine task of caring for all these children. And she turned to female victims of the Holocaust um, who had survived um, and worked with them alongside them to provide care for these children. Uh, it's really, I think, impossible for us to try to imagine what that was like. Here she writes in the album, after several months of loving care, they know again how to smile and laugh. And that's such a hope giving image or set of images that these children are regaining some level of health and comfort and safety. Here Lena reflects, I was suffering enormously. I was traveling constantly. I did not have the means to support these children. The committee was in constant financial predicaments. They never had any money and called on various private people, begging them for money to maintain the children. I traveled to Warsaw, to the joint, and we were not allowed to give us money. And in spite of everything, the director of the joint, Gutzik, always helped me, even though illegally, so as not to throw these children out on the street. Every, every week, every few days, I was faced with an alternative of closing down the home and finding the children themselves out in the street. I did not have any idea how we would live through the next week in such a financial strait we found ourselves. So you can see that she's, she's actually hitting the pavement, trying to raise enough funds to keep these children fed and clothed. And another thing that happens um, is she's finding more children. She reflects over and over, oh, I heard about some children who had been stashed in such and such a, a, an orphanage or that they were in hiding, in, in hiding at such and such a place. And she goes and tries to bring the children to this orphanage. Um, so, uh, and it must have been just a constant um, struggle. One thing uh, I, I meant to mention at the beginning, I apologize, there is a book and a documentary about Lena Kukler. The book was written by Lena Kukler. It's called My 100 Children. And there was a, a docu-series that, that came out after, afterwards. Um, and in that book, she mentions that part of the struggle that she found the most challenging was deciding which children to try to take over the border because along the way, some parents had emerged and found or been reunited with their children. So this album page has photographs of parents who managed to survive, whether in hiding or in the camps, um, the Holocaust, and managed to miraculously find their children again. Um, and she writes in her memoir that for the older children, after a certain amount of time had gone by and they were facing leaving Poland, she could ask them, do you want to come with us or do you want to stay here and try to find your family? But for the younger children, she had to decide for them. And she talks about having a real, real difficulty doing that. Um, uh, so here Lena says, I have here a little girl who sat two and a half years in a wardrobe. Let me take a moment and talk about this. A lot of the children who survived in Poland survived in hiding. And we have uh, survivors in our own community who were in hiding, um, tucked away for years. Um, and so here she's describing the effects. 
a tiny child, three years old, this child was completely unable to walk or talk when, it, when the child came out of the wardrobe it was hidden in. It was emaciated, covered with lice. By some miracle, we pulled the child out of the wardrobe because the woman who kept her in the, in the wardrobe in Warsaw had left the dwelling, locked the door, and didn't come back anymore. And this child had been there for two days without food. And then we found out about it and we pulled this child out through the window. I have children who sat in hiding places for a year or two with legs doubled up so that they were eventually um, had complete atrophy of the leg muscles. They were unable to walk. So here we see some pretty brutal descriptions of the effects of being a child in hiding. Um, and as I was mentioning before, she finds children over and over again during this process. There's a story um, in one of the sources I read of her pulling a baby um, off its mother's corpse in Warsaw um, and rescuing that baby. So just amazing, intense historical sources of how people stood up and tried to rescue their neighbors. Um, here, here we see that the album depicts this from a more positive side uh, viewpoint. In sunshine and snow, backs and legs bent from crouching in narrow hiding places are getting straight again. So she's saying we're able to help these children become rehabilitated through good old fashioned outdoor and exercise and eating healthy food and getting medical care. Um, so. I think these are some really beautiful and hope-giving photos. A sledge excursion to the, I'm sorry, let me find what it says there. Uh, I can't see it on my screen, one moment. A sledge excursion to the mountains shortly before leaving Poland in February, 1946. So here they're taking a little, um, break from the daily grind as it were and you can see there's just a lot of kids and they're having a great time um although i'll just take a moment to say going sledding in the mountains with that many children seems really stressful to me and i don't have any of the concerns that lena did so kudos to her um in her interview lena spends a lot of time talking about these children these children were rescued from a Catholic orphanage. And so Lena heard about a Catholic orphanage that was um, under duress. It was unable to feed the children there. And there is some aspect of her description saying that the Jewish children were much higher risk of, of not surviving due to starvation um, and discrimination. And so she goes in and, and um, gets these children out of that orphanage and takes them to her orphanage under great duress. And these were, these children were younger than many of the other children she rescued. So they got nicknamed the, she calls them Bobbles, or probably Babala in some of her writings, but here she says they're the babes. Here are some girls from the orphanage in Rabka and a group of boys from Robka. And then some of the older girls and some of the older boys. Um, and here's, here's some, some tough stuff again. So in, in Poland, there's a historical anti-Semitism that is deep. Um, that's part of the reason the Holocaust happened there because the Germans didn't think there would be as much resistance. Um, and shockingly to me anyway, that anti-Semitism was so rampant that after the Holocaust and as these communities are attempting to rebuild, there were, there were waves of anti-Semitic anti violence. Um, and there was an attack on one of these orphanages, which is appalling. Um, so here she's describing some of the anti-Semitism her students or her, the children in the orphanage experience, and then she'll describe the attack later. Moreover, we were surrounded by a wave of such anti-Semitism that it's impossible to describe. The children could not go out on the street at all. They were hit with stones on the head. 
When I sent three boys to the movies, other Polish boys sitting behind them were threatening them the whole time to, with a stick, to stick a knife in their backs. I could not send the children to Polish schools because they were so persecuted and insulted. Um, along the way, in her memoir, she, st she, she described having the growing sense that the children were not safe in Poland. And she realizes she has to get them out, but that's almost impossible. Here's another page from the album where she says that the older girls are learning crafts. Um, and then um, to, to, to sum up Lena's solution for this, she works with an incredible network of aid societies, predominantly Jewish aid societies, to orchestrate a plan to smuggle these children out of Poland. So uh, there's around 100 children. By the time she makes the final plans, they decide to immigrate with about 60. There's no way to legally leave Poland at this time with this group of children. So the, the Jewish aid societies and Lena and her team um, essentially smuggle the children illegally over the border from Poland into, the Czech, into Czechoslovakia at that time, and then from Czechoslovakia into France. Um, and then from France, the game plan was to get um, certificates to immigrate to Israel. Um, and so when Lena meets the Zale family, she is in Paris. So she's gotten these 60 children across the border twice into France, and they're in a new orphanage in Paris or outside of Paris. Um, and then incredibly, the children you see in this album page were on the ship, the Exodus, in 1947, which is the ship um, that was bringing about 4,500 um, Jewish refugees um, attempting to come into what was then Palestine, uh, which became really an earmark battle for, um, or message that 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 there should be a way to immigrate to what is now Israel for victims of the Holocaust. There, uh, here's some photos of some children who ended up in Israel. So uh, about, I think, 45 children ended up making it all the way to Israel. Some went to the United States. Um, and here Elena is talking about this. We desire to live in Palestine. The children desire that, and we do too, I most of all. We have enough of wandering, enough of roaming. We do not want to be insulted anymore with being a Jew. We want to be proud of it, and we are proud of it, that we are Jews. We want to live in our own country, on our own land, and to be citizens of our own country. We want to develop free and unimpeded. It is not important to us that the living conditions are harder than, for instance, in France. It's not important to us that it's very difficult there now that there's a battle going on. We want to fight for our fatherland, for our country. We long to be on our own land. We lost everything. We have no family. We have no parents. We have no children. We have no wives. The children have no parents. We long to have our own land. This is for us. It's our aim. Um, so this is 1946, and Lena is, is staunchly Zionist in her view. Um, and her children, um, or the children in the orphanage also desire to find a new home in a big sense, a capital H. Here is a, a very sweet and uplifting collage of photographs from the album. So this is a Purim celebration that the students are celebrating. Um, just to take a moment to talk about the fact that most of these children were hidden um, either with Catholic identities or converted to Catholicism, or living with Catholic families, some not, but most of them were. And so obviously Lena is doing work in that orphanage to re, um, remind the children of their Jewish identity. So um, on this topic, a part of the children, some of the children were hidden in Polish cloisters. In some of the cloisters, the children were converted and later on the priests did not want to return these children. Only from a few orphanage where there, where, where there reigned a terrible hunger, where they could not feed the children, even the Polish children, there they first of all tried to get rid of the Jewish children and they would bring them to the committee. 
So that's a little, th this interview was done in three languages and the translation sometimes a little bumpy. Um, but essentially she's saying when children were saved by Catholic organizations, sometimes they didn't want to turn them back over to Jewish organizations. Um, the exception she's mentioning here is that some orphanage were, orphanages were so destitute that they handed over the Jewish children to the Jewish um, aid societies. And that's how she got those little, little kids, the baubles. So here she says, they argue that they will return them later, that the priest is against it, seeing that these children are converted and they're already Catholic children, that they will again, that we will again make Jews out of them. They resisted as much as they could. Then they told me that the children are dirty, that they will wash them first, that they will bathe them first, and they will comb them first. I, however, implored them to release these children immediately because we will already take care of these children, that I will wash and bathe them ourselves, that we will. So she's saying that when she attempts to get children from that are Jewish children out of orphanages, there's all these delaying tactics and resistance, um, and that she had to do a lot of convincing, including um, bribing and getting special dispensation and paperwork. Um, she mentions that she used her brother, who had a high ranking position in the Polish government to help with some of these things, to, to force the hand to get these children out of these orphanages so she could um, take care of them. So here, and, and I, I don't know a ton about this, but these are children that ended up going to America, which was very hard to arrange, but they did, these children arranged were, um, were able to immigrate to America. So um, towards the end of her interview, she, she talks about all the care that they were trying to provide these children and education and health care. Um, and she says that they didn't have a lot of time towards the end because they were arranging this great escape where they were trying to cross the border from Poland and end up in Paris. Um, this is a collage of photos really meant as a special thank you to the Zale family. Um, Edith, we see pictured here, had tuberculosis of the lungs and bones. And she's saying that she owes her recovery to the help offered by the Zale family. Um, and we can see she's in a hospital here. Um, one side note, tuberculosis is a horrible disease, um, but a lot of people contracted tuberculosis during World War II and it took often, if they recovered, I should say, years and years and years of hospital care um, to recover. It was a pretty serious. Um, and expensive. Here's another ch child. She's a little, little bit, um, and she's been cured of tuberculosis of the bones and lungs thanks to help from the Zale family. She's teeny tiny. So again, in Lena Kukler's words, I wanted to work with my entire soul, so there should not remain any time for thinking or brooding or memories. So as to be able to forget everything, all that I had lost, all that I had lived through in the past, and nothing else mattered to me. Um, the interviewer, Boder, um, had psychological training. I don't know the question that prompted this answer, um, but I think it is fascinating that, that she's able to recognize, recognize in herself that part of her drive was to basically work so much and so hard that she didn't have to deal with her own pain. She lost a child during the Holocaust. She and her husband lived apart and eventually di uh, divorced immediately after the Holocaust. Um, she saw truly unimaginable things. Um, and so I thought that was an interesting quote. Um, here we have some photographs of children out and about around the orphanage. Um, and here, this stuff is hard to read, but it does show what she was dealing with. So Lena describes that the children absolutely did not know what meat was. They had never in their lives eaten meat. They did not know what chocolate was. They did not know what candy was. They had never had anything sweet in their mouths. They did not even know how to eat these things. They'd only been fed potatoes and occasionally some mush and black coffee. 
these children were two or three years old and had never been out on the street. They did not go out at all because they had no clothes. And in Zakopan, the winter lasts a long time. So here she's specifically talking about those children that she rescued from the from that Catholic orphanage, uh, the little, little kids. Um, and describing in her own words in 1946, the really desperate situation for these children. And I mean, let's take a moment to realize these children were the lucky ones because they had survived. A million and a half that, you know, children died in the Holocaust, were murdered in the Holocaust. So to try to bring it back to, to something a little more uplifting, here we have photographs of Lena with the children around the orphanage. Um, some really beautiful depictions of basically they're, they're living as a big family. I'm sure it wasn't simple or easy though. Here Lena says, I do not have a family of my own. I have nobody. I have only one brother who remains in Poland, but who, who has his own ideological work. He is a communist, but I'm not. I'm a Zionist. We differ in views. My entire family are these children here in this house. Like I mentioned, Lena had lost her entire family. She did have a brother who survived, but he decided to go one path and she went another. Um, she ended up immigrating to Israel with the children and, and lived the rest of her life there. Um, just before I go to this, um, Lena ended up publishing five books about her journey with these children. Um, they are um, mostly in Yiddish and in Hebrew, but one, My Hundred Children, which was published in 1959, um, was uh, translated into dozens of languages and is available if you want to read more about Lena and her work on Amazon. Um, and then finally, just to show you really the long-term impact of Lena's work, this is a photograph of children survivors of the Holocaust that Lena rescued in, Pal in Israel in 2001. Um, this photo is from the Ghetto Fighters House Museum. Pretty interesting. So there's about 30 of them here, um, and there's still survivors from Lena's children um, who are alive today all over the world. Uh, there's a few resources I want to recommend if you'd like to read more. There's some. There's a good article on Yad Vashem about Lena Kukler. Um, the oral history interview that I excerpted from for this presentation is available in its entirety, and it is very interesting and worth reading. Um, again, My 100 Children, an autobiography, is available on Amazon. Um, I have a citation for that photo. And then finally, there, there's more than one, but there's one interview in particular on U the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum website um, of an interview with one of the rescued children to see from that perspective. Um, okay, I think we can open it up for questions. I'm a little ahead of myself. I guess I drank too much coffee. Um, and, and talked a little fast, but um, we would love to take some questions now. Let's see here. If you type them in the Q&A. And then we can chat. So yes, there were reunions of these children. Um, that photo is from 2001, but there were other ones. Uh, Felicia, there was another question that was uh, asked about uh, whether or not there were uh, children's homes after the war, whether children, Jewish children were a lot left to fend for themselves. And the answer is yes and yes. Um, there were uh, Jewish children's homes, there were orphanages um, in any number of European countries. Um, there were also orphanages in the United States. Uh, Jewish, there was a, a Jewish orphanage in New York uh, that when they were able to get the children or survivors over here, uh, took them in. Our own uh, Max Glauben, uh, when he arrived in the States initially, was, was housed at a children's orphanage uh, in New York that had made room specifically for uh, child survivors. He was already a, a, a later teen at that point. Um, there, were, there were unfortunately never enough of them. And so there were, there were children that ended up without parents in DP camps who were taken care of 
by uh, older uh, DPs once they were capable of doing so, uh, some of whom uh, themselves had, had either lost family or lost uh, children during the war. Um, and, and, you know, we're looking to, to, to make, remake this human connection as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Um, and you have to juxtapose this against the larger situation, which is that, you know, there's, there's millions and millions of, of dead during the war, vast displacement of, of populations, um, and an iron curtain uh, descending on Europe. So, so it's not necessarily that Jewish children were ignored. It's that, that there's many, many others who are, who are suffering and, and there's a lot of effort to, to, to begin to help people put their lives back together, not just these children. Well, and, and that's something in the museum we try to portray, which is that, you know, 1945 is really the beginning of the journey for many people. And that um, the lucky ones found a path to rebuild their lives and not everyone did. And that rebuilding process could start in a DP camp or an orphanage and end up taking five or 10 years to get to the goal destination if they ever did. Um, and it's in just the size of the crisis of how many people were basically uprooted and had nowhere to go. Um, so I have a question here. What kind of help did she receive? She was receiving some financial support. Um, I, I am by no means an expert about this. I don't know if you know a lot about this, Sarah, but basically there were intense rules and regulation about transferring financial um, mm -hmm. donations through and over borders. And so part of the challenge, if you were an aid society in war-torn Poland, while there might be people let's say in the United States, uh, let's say in France, who were willing and eager to help rescue these children, getting that money to that destination was hugely complicated and sometimes not possible. Um, and then there was a, a, a huge network of rescue associations, some of which worked well together, some of which did not work well together. Um, and so, but specifically in Paris, Lena Kukler meets the Zales and they financially help once they're in Paris, especially particularly with medical care. Alicia, um, sorry, quickly while you're answering questions, we had a request, if you could go back one slide to the resources, we have someone oh, who wants yeah. to take a picture of that. You don't have to go full screen, I think, but if you just wanna go back one. Perfect, thank you. You can see that? Yes. Oh, cool. <laughs> um, did Lena and the Zales stay in contact? They did. Um, the Zales had a, a correspondence with Lena Kukler for some years to come after this, um, this album. Uh, we don't have those letters, but I do know that that happened. Um, how was she able to move 100 children from Poland to France? That's a great question. Um, well, so the first thing is that of the 100, for lots of reasons, she ends up going down to about 60. Um, and she partnered with Jewish aid societies or, uh, you know, help organizations in Poland and, and over the border who had been, you know, smuggling people back and forth before and after her. Um, and they, they, they teamed up and helped the, get these kids across the border. But it was hugely risky. Um, I don't know the, the details on how they did it. Do you know anything more about that, Sarah? What I remember, and again, this is not my area of expertise, is that there was some walking involved, some trains involved, and they didn't yeah. all go at once. Yeah. Um, this was done piecemeal. Um, yeah. And, you know, as, as Felicia noted, the impetus was was when the, the home in Zakopane was attacked. Um, but she had already been making plans at that point to start getting them out. That just kind of s speeded up her, her time frame. Well, and she had to make some tough decisions because they had to have some way of knowing that these children would, let's say they made it all the way to Palestine, that they would be cared for and able to survive in Palestine, which was a little bit uh, intense in the late 40s, to say the least. And so part of her calculus is how old are these kids? Is there a better option? Um, should we leave some in Paris? Should, should, are some better off here? Um, how can they rebuild their lives once they're in Palestine? And so it's, it was incredibly complex and very brave 
Um, but I think the other side is that in a lot of ways, she didn't think she had a choice, um, that, that the children didn't have a choice but to try to escape. Um, how did parents know about Lena's home and possibly find their children? So there were huge displaced persons list and a huge effort to reunite families, not only um, just on the street in Poland, but in camps and di displaced persons camps, there's a huge network, um, Red Cross, but also chiefly, I think, a lot of Jewish aid societies working on this. There were Yiddish um, newspapers that were published in the camps and people would put ads in those Yiddish right. newspapers looking for relatives. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, so that's the, the um, it's impossible for me to even manage to think about that. But then the other side of it is we know um, from things we've heard from our own survivors that that was only partially successful, of course, because we have survivors who found family members 60, 70 years later. Yeah. Um, so though, so while that effort was underway and it was incredibly vital, um, it also didn't work in a lot of, you know, there's plenty of missed connections, you know, to put it not as delicately as I want to, I guess. Um, what about the 40 children left behind? I know that if they thought there was a lead on um, finding family, they stayed behind. Other than that, I don't know a lot about the other children. Um, so she was supported financially to to pay to for for the children, um, and then the papers for the children. They were waiting for certificates. You couldn't legally immigrate to Palestine, but you could get a certificate of transport or uh, to get across the border. Is there is there more to say about that, Sarah? Yeah, so um, it, 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 earlier, Felicia, when you were talking about this, you talked about the fact that some of the kids went on the exodus in 47. Right. And so this is a partial um, answer to that question as well, because while you may have had to pay uh, monies to get papers to get you across borders or to grief calm so that you could move across borders without official papers. Moving into Palestine uh, between uh, 46 uh, and 48 was completely illegal. Um, and so that is the, 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 what the British called the illegal uh, the illegal immigration to mandatory Palestine, what the um, state in waiting that became modern Israel called Aliyah Beit or uh, Immigration uh, B, and it was the clandestine operation to bring survivors and hidden individuals and displaced persons uh, to Palestine. And so you were not paying transport on these ships. The ships the ships were illegal. And so the Exodus is the perfect example of this. It's crammed to the gills. It's a former freighter um, that's repurposed. Um, they, they strip the interior of the ship and they lay down wooden bunks. Um, I've even seen accountings that it looks almost like the shelving that you had for warehousing uh, survivors in, uh, or uh, uh, excuse me, um, uh, concentration camp um, incarcerees in barracks. The difference is that they knew they were heading potentially to an independent land and freedom. And so it, it just, it makes all the difference in the world in terms of emphasis. Um, but these ships get to Palestine running the British blockade and then they, like the Exodus, many of them are intercepted um, either in international waters or right as they begin to make their run at the, at the, the Israeli slash Pal mandatory Palestine coast. Um, and some of these people make it successfully. Many others are interned in Cyprus and have to wait until 48 um, and Britain's official uh, retreat from uh, mandatory Palestine and the outbreak of hostilities, uh, May 15th, 1948, to then begin to make their way from Cyprus back to the newly independent and now fighting for its life uh, state of Israel. Well, and uh, so just to tell you what happens on the other side, the 60 that make it through this intense process and make it to Palestine ended up mostly settling on a kibbutz um, that was essentially an orphanage. So. Um, 
that was the the end goal but the path was by no means certain and i think the certificates and I'm, i may not be correct but i think the certificates were actually the jewish aid society having given you a spot to get on one of these ships but jewish, i'm not 100 percent. i think do you mean the jewish agency felicia the, the, I may. the authority in palestine i think so yeah yeah the other really interesting thing when you, when you talk about them settling on a kibbutz that's essentially an orphanage, um, for, for those of you who, who are not aware, the kibbutz is a, is a, it's a collective farming operation and they, they were set up all over uh, Palestine uh, and they continue to exist today in Israel. Um, and they're kind of a, mostly a socialist Zionist experiment in kind of back to the land farming and communal living, but up until the, the late 70s to early 80s, children on these kibbutzim, even if they had parents on these kibbutzes, they didn't live with their parents. They lived in a children's house and they saw their parents a few times a week. And so, in fact, it's not as strange as it sounds to our current ears that a kibbutz would take in a, you know, a large number of children for whom there weren't necessarily parents, although there would be adults on the kibbutz who, you know, who, would, who would see to their schooling and see to their training and all of this kind of thing, because that was a fairly standard arrangement anyway uh, on the kibbutzim at that time, which is you didn't live with your parents. Um, you, you, you lived in camaraderie with a group of children. And the camaraderie was something that, that extended throughout your life because when you went in to do military service, um, you frequently went in with the same group of kids that you had grown up running around the kibbutz with. I mean, so, so you were, even though you had no parents, you were never alone the way we understand it in terms of a nuclear family. Well, in that photograph, let me scoot back up to that. That photograph was taken at a reunion at the kibbutz where they they ended up settling so they've come back here what is it the 55 years later almost a little over 50 years later to uh as a group to to remember their time there as children um what bought, brought the Zales to France? I'm not a thousand percent sure, but what I do know is that Edna Zale was renowned for her philanthropic um work both here and in Europe. Um, and so she really, from what I heard from the donors, was behind their work to um, assist Lena Kukler as she, she tried to provide care for these children. Did they have to change the children's last names? I think most people who immigrated to Israel did, or Palestine did change their names. Do you wanna speak about that? Yeah, so, so many people changed their names. There's a number of reasons why they did it. Um, it's considered, uh, your 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 exilic name your your um your diaspora name was considered a, a a holdover of the bad old days and so many who moved to israel changed their names i'll give you um a perfect example the newscaster wolf blitzer of uh, uh, cnn newscaster um in israel his name would have been changed to zeev barak which is just a literal translation of the two names. The Ev is wolf um, and blitzer, uh, lightning becomes Barak. Um, that's a very normal thing. If you wanted to take a position within the um, civil uh, administ government administration, you were required to change your name. You were requ required to Hebraicize your name from whatever it was before. Um, if you went to live on a kibbutz, you weren't required to, but there was a lot of pressure to do this, um, to become a new, a new Ivri, a new Hebrew man or a new Hebrew woman. You see less of this amongst the, um, the Orthodox uh, who settle in Israel. Um, they're not, well, many of them are Zionists. I'm not talking about the ultra-Orthodox, but they're less concerned about this, this kind of thing. But there is definitely societal pressure um, to change your, your um, previous uh, name. And if you look at people like um, David Ben-Gurion, I mean, his, his um, name in, in, in Europe was not, you know, son of, son of a young lion. Trust me on that. That, that. that is a heroic, you know, settler of the land name. And so there's a lot of this kind of thing. Um, because these weren't 
these weren't governmental entities and the kids themselves weren't, weren't settled uh, you know, directly by the government. My guess would be that they weren't forced to change their names, but I would guess that probably many of them did just because of, given the tenor of the times and the expectations. Well, and I can speak to this from an archival standpoint, it's often really um, intense for us to trace um, people both before or if even if they don't um, immigrate to Palestine. I mean, people would change their names every time they crossed a border, every time they were hoping to cross a border, every time they were hoping for a different kind of job. And that's within Europe. And certainly if they ended up in the United States, almost guaranteed there'll be some either transliteration mistake, transcription mistake, um, some sort of different spelling that was adopted along the way. I mean, so finding and tracing people as they make their way from, you know, ostensibly Eastern Europe to Europe, mainland Europe, mainland Europe, I'm using that wrong, to Western Europe, um, maybe to Palestine, then Israel, maybe to the United States. I mean, uh, the name changes were rampant and pretty hard to trace. It's, it's really intense and you can never assume you have it right. Yeah, I'm thinking, Felicia, of the, the, some of the founders of our museum. So Mike Jacobs, who, who is acknowledged as, as probably the, the original founder of the museum. Mike Jacobs did not go by Mike Jacobs in, in uh, Europe. Um, he went by Mendel Yakubovich. Um, so it's not the same name. Uh, Jack Rep uh, of blessed memory, um, as is Mike, but Jack passed away very recently. Jack Rep, until he came to the United States, went by Itzik Repkovitz. Uh, Max Glauben uh, was Maniek Glauben. Um, and now he calls himself Globen, and then he was Glauben. Uh, so Maniek Glauben becomes Max Globen. Uh, and that, that's, that's, pretty standard um, when, when, when they came to the US, they attempted to Americanize their names, but also in all honesty to Americanize their personas, whatever that means. And I say whatever that means because, you know. Different for different, different people. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Individual. Different folks for different folks as they always used to say. Yeah, yeah. But, but so, so, you know, your but name is also, your identity. There was sometimes you know, you can you can kind of wrap your mind around why having Yakubovich as your last name is a struggle, um, but then also there's weird pressure to, to de-German your last name too. Yeah. So yeah. it could even be as subtle as that. Okay, I think we've answered all our questions. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we'll be having some more lectures coming up, including with Dr. Sarah Abosh next week. Uh, talking about Jewish faith and identity, and I think it's going to be a good one. I'm going to tune in for that. I hope you all have a good Thursday. Bye, everybody.